first of all, I want to, uh, uh, Rocky, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to sit down with uh, me and talk. Uh, I'm happy hockey. to do it, especially well, on a game day, which is great, so you can kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to watch a little hockey. And, uh, and maybe get a dinner out of it. I hear there's a dinner involved yeah. as well. And won't be separate checks. <laughs> oh, no, really? No, cause, Am I picking up the whole thing? You are. Okay, well, it's, <laughs> that's only fair. It's only fair. Yeah, John McDonough's too cheap. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I hear. That's his reputation no, around, around right. the league. I just give him brief reputation. I know, I know. I'm just kidding. Um, so the Hockey News has uh, this unique global audience. We have, uh, I've acquired it two years ago, and I noticed that 40% of the readers are in Canada, 40 in the U.S., but 20% are around the world. And when I sort of polled readers on what they wanted to know more about, they said, we want more hockey, we want more background on owners and what they're thinking and what the business of hockey. So, so I decided to put together this money and power issue, and it was successful last year. So. We're here today, I want to talk to you a little bit about your business, if sure. that's okay. I know you talk a lot about the on-ice performance, but let's talk about the off-ice. That's well, more fun. Well, I think it's more fun, but... Uh, I can't control what goes on the ice, but I can help on the off-ice. Well, that's, that's why you're here and Jonathan Taze is not uh, tonight. <laughs> you know, um, preparing for this conversation with you, uh, I had done my standard reading and, you know, on you and stuff like that, but then um, one of your people sent me the, the breakaway, the book. And it just threw me off completely uh, as to what I was going to ask you. And it sort, of, it sort of brought everything into focus a little bit more for me. Uh, it's a great book, and um, I think everybody in the hockey world should get a hold of it and read it. it. It certainly tells a great story of your franchise. Well, thank you. But it, you know, the words family, we came over in 1857. So we were farmers, and it uh, didn't have a pot to piss in. My great-great-grandfather uh, was a farmer. And we still have the original family land grant 60 miles north of Chicago. You do? Yeah, I have a farms. Really? And um, so it, it humbles you to think where you came from. Mm. Uh, and the only way we got in the, the sports business was because he had bought the defunct properties, and these are these old st uh, stadiums. Mm. And one time he had Detroit Olympia, uh, Chicago Stadium, the Old Med Square Garden, and the St. Louis uh, Arena, mm. and then bought the franchises in those. So we have the Blackhawks on our balance sheet. Uh, for twenty thousand dollars, <laughs> I don't know what they're worth, but I know they're worth more than twenty thousand. That's a big capital gain you're going to have. That, to pay. that is. So uh, we're not selling anything. You can't sell. We're not selling anything. <laughs> and uh, so it's important to um, progress this. You know, uh, we're lucky enough to have four generations in the in the family business. And you, in the U.S., you think how many how few companies are around for four generations? I think you're down. I know you're down to single digits, but it might be down to six, seven percent can make four generations, and it drops down even more from the time you get to fifth, and there's very few in the sixth. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we've been in business a long time, but it's a business. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you, you, you know, winning is everything, but uh, you have to make money or you're not going to be in business. And so everything we do, we try to figure out how we can make money, uh, not for today, mm -hmm. but to pass this business on to the next generation. And you, your background, uh, you know, having worked on the business of, you know, um, you know, you had all kinds of business experience before you came to the Blackhawks. And when you, when you took over in 07, you sort of took all that experience that you had from running other businesses, beverage businesses and so on and so forth, real estate, and you sort of brought it to bear here with the Chicago Blackhawks, didn't you? Well, uh, I, I did use some of the same. Um, in the beverage business, two-thirds of your balance sheet is inventory and receivables, but you're in a sales business. And so uh, operations, sales, and finance have to work together like a three-legged stool. Uh, when we came over to the Blackhawks, I didn't think that we had that approach. Um, that front office, the business operations, uh, hockey operations, and finance. Uh, the hockey operations was far uh, treated more, uh, more superior within the organization. And, um, but I knew in these other companies, you, you have to have good people. And you can't uh, run things without having good people around. Um, so, the first person I talked to after Dad's passing was Jerry Reinsdorf, and Jerry had won uh, rings in more than one sport, uh, you know, baseball and in, uh, you know, you know, basketball, and you know, a Hall of Fame individual, wonderful man. His word is his bond. And I said, Jerry, do you have any advice for me? He said, Well, if you want to be involved with your other businesses, you need a full-time president. And I said, Well, do you have any idea who that would be? He said, No, quite frankly, I don't. So I knew we needed a full-time president, but I had admired the job that John McDonough had done with the Chicago Cubs for many years. 
Never met the man. I was a White Sox fan myself uh, way before Jerry bought that, that fly, uh, White Sox. But um, I admired the job he did with, with the uh, Cubs with a subpar, uh, many, many years subpar on the field. But he was very, I think if he didn't leave the league in attendance, he was number two. And he had one of the higher ticket prices in there. And how you could be able to do that with a subpar team for 20 plus years, um, you had to have a really good businessman. Yeah. So uh, yes, I'd, I'd learned something in the other businesses and it was a sales business. So when we talked together, I, he realized the same thing I did. And this company has to all work together. And you can't you know, have the we and they attitude and no one can do any better than anyone doing any worse. And if you approach it that way, um, and it's a relationship business. Uh, the beverage business is a relationship. Many of our contracts are 30-day contracts. Supplier can come in and materially change uh, uh, your business course with the flick of the big pen. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the relationship with, with uh, that supplier, you have a problem. And then your customers. Now, at the time, I knew the Blackhawks because even though I, I lived in Chicago all my life, I knew we didn't have very good relationships as, a, as an organization. Mm -hmm. We are at war with the press that wrote about you every day. Mm -hmm. We are essentially at war with our players that, you know, are your employees. Mm -hmm. We are at war with the corporate community. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there weren't too many people we weren't at war with. So other than that, we got along with everybody. <laughs> yeah. It was easy. To, you, you could just turn, the, you know, and any group you knew you had to improve your relationship That's with. That's right. So you just roll up your sleeves and mm -hmm. saying, all right. And, you know, the first thing uh, we did, I went in and, and visited all the, um, the, new, uh, the sports newsrooms. Mm -hmm. And met the sports editor, gave my business card, and told him who I was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you had to give your business card for them to know who you were. Really? I have no idea. I wasn't I even. I, my name was not even in the press guide. Wow. Even though I'd been a uh, alternate governor mm -hmm. for over twenty years, mm -hmm. but no one knew that. Um, the league knew it, mm -hmm. but uh, for whatever reason, I'd show up for the team picture, but they didn't. They never listed me in any way or form. So many people that were involved mm -hmm. uh, in this in, in hockey, especially in Chicago, mm -hmm. were surprised. Uh, even though we had a succession agreement understood and everyone in the family knew who would take over after uh, my dad passed away. Mm -hmm. But people outside the boardroom and the family had, had really had no idea. And my brother and dad never really told them. And, I, you know, that wasn't my place to tell them. No, no, clearly it wasn't. Um, but you took over. You brought in John. You brought in a, a surround yourself with a, obviously a great management team. Did you have any thoughts of running it yourself? I mean, you run, you've run a bunch of businesses. Did you ever have like a thought, well, I'm going to run it? This no, I never did. I said I was here to uh, give support mm -hmm. to, to John and make mm -hmm. sure, you know, it's the first uh, non-words president in I don't know how many years mm -hmm. after Jimmy Norris passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, Dad became uh, president of the Blackhawks. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was important to uh, not to get so involved in the day-to-day because -day mm -hmm. it's not fair for the organization. And I think John could shape a better organization uh, without me in any way meddling. Now, he and I talk all the time, mm -hmm. and there's no surprises. Uh, and we have a terrific uh, working relationship. We have a flat organization. That's a big thing. I mean, you know, John was work, worked for the Cubs, but it's part of the Tribune Corporation. Mm -hmm. And he's used to, you know, asking permission. I said, no, no, uh, you know, we ask for forgiveness. We just move ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I said, there's no grass under our feet. We're going to move. And... And what's surprising at the time, mm -hmm. this is back in 07, the Hawks hadn't, hadn't done too well. Yeah. That first year we uh, had 10 sellouts, which is previous, that's more than the previous um, five years combined. Wow. And uh, really, uh, it, it um, so, but, you know, what I didn't know, which is the biggest surprise, is how much the, the individual team with the Hawks were hemorrhaging money. Mm -hmm. I saw the consolidated tax return, but Dad would never share me the individual uh, financial statements of the Blackhawks. Mm -hmm. So in 07, a few days after his death, when I got a call from the uh, Black Hawk controller and saying, we're out of cash, I said, what do you mean you're out of cash? This, you know, we have 13 pay, you know, pay periods for the hockey players. He said, well, we went through it all in our, our uh, first uh, uh, paycheck. I said, well, we have 12 more. Um, how much will I need to fund for those players? He said, oh, 35, but probably closer to 40 million. So, uh, people were back there in business in 07. When 08 came, you know, um, you know the U.S. Um, financial crisis was here. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to hoard as much cash as possible. I didn't want to go into the banks and start borrowing money to, um, to, uh, to fund an operating loss. That's no way, because once you do that, you can't get out of the banks. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only way to do it was roll up your sleeve and do whatever you could do. 
And we all worked hard to do that. And I said, I worked on relationships. John was always very good in relationships. We built organization. Mm -hmm. And we uh, had people that, for the Blackhawks that wanted to work. But I also realized we didn't have enough people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had, um, coming from the beverage business, the sales business, you need a sales force. You need people out there to drive your top line. Mm -hmm. We had cut so many expenses mm -hmm. that we didn't even have bottled water in the locker room. Wow. I mean, you know, sixth grade a girls uh, soccer team has water in their locker room. Yeah, no question. But that's how bad it had gotten, cutting expenses. So uh, you, cut, cut, you can't cut your, uh, your way to prosperity. And so we had to change the whole culture around. It's, no, we're going to fund this. We're going to do it the right way. We're not going to spend money for spending money, but we're going to spend money and do it the right way. And we have to do it with people and train them, give them support, and then let them do their job and get out of their way. And uh, if they don't do their job, we'll find people that do. So not only did you have to sort of make up that 20, 30, 40 million dollar shortfall, but you also had to invest additional funds in getting players, better players, um, building out organizations. When you hire people, that's money up front and stuff like that. Did you feel like at that point in time, I mean, you, there was no turning back. This is a works owned business. It's always going to be. It's not like you said, it's never going to be for sale. It wasn't for sale back then. It no. won't be in the future. Did you sort of feel like your back was against the wall a little bit from a, from a business point of view? You just were coming in this thing, you were coming in cold, and all of a sudden you have a capital call of 30 or 40 million plus you've got to invest more money to make this thing work. I mean, did you have some sleepless nights about that? Well, um, I knew you could always sell it. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time you probably could have gotten 100, 120 you know, uh, million for it. I, I know they're worth, I mean, you know, when you look at uh, Seattle, 650 million now. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, what, but I knew we were the third largest media market. Mm -hmm. uh, we had um, a vehicle to make money as far as a hard cap. It wasn't enough, but it was at least a vehicle. At that time it was at 53 or 54%. Um, that we would you know, split with the players is now 50-50. Mm -hmm. But I at least knew that we had a vehicle to do this. So um, I, I thought, you know, uh, it's too easy to give up. Yeah. So why not give it a good shot? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you surround yourself with good people and, and work on that, and for whatever reasons, the fans started um, warming up to the team. Mm -hmm. And it's like all of a sudden when you're uh, invited back to Thanksgiving dinner when you've been ostracized for many years. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fans wanted to, to be part of the Hawks, and they wanted, but they weren't going to give the Wurtz's money if they thought that they were going to be uh, marginalized and taken for granted. Mm -hmm. And so when we started talking about different things and, and developing, and, and uh, so the first thing we started doing is saying, we're not going to bring free agents in to bring free agents in, but we're going we're to fill those gaps where they need to be bringing them. So when they saw the Brian Campbell coming, and then they saw that you know, John and I had talked from day one is what we wanted to do was to model the Blackhawks as a golden franchise. And a golden franchise, not only in hockey, but any sport. Mm -hmm. And if that means whatever the fans, that if you're, you know, that if you look at some of these, if it's in New York Yankees or, uh, or the, um, you know, uh, the, or the Patriots from New England or whomever. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought we could do that. And because uh, we had the vehicle to do that, uh, we had a, you know, we were lucky enough to be original six, so we had a pedigree. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't buy a pedigree. But we got one. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dream at the time was you go anywhere in the world and see that Black Hawk crest mm -hmm. somewhere on people. And you, it's surprising on wherever you travel around, um, if it's Europe or you know, anywhere. I mean, I've gotten things from Southeast Asia. People have, you know, jerseys and or windbreakers or hats on. And it's amazing because the depth of this organization can be there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, you know, we've been able to work at. Now, Granted, we've been very fortunate to win three cups in, in uh, 10, 13, and 15. Mm -hmm. That helps a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, we've been two years out of the playoffs, but th those fans have been very loyal. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see tonight at the game, uh, it's, uh, it's, an ex it's an experience to be here. It's a fun place to be. Mm -hmm. um, children are here. For years, you never saw any kids because mm -hmm. no one wanted to bring their children to watch the, the Blackhawks unless it was a, you know, because many of our games were Wednesday or, or Sunday night games. Um, but you'd be surprised how many people will be there tonight and how many children are there, uh, you know, and, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's just a fun experience. Well, speaking of children, first of all, you, so you've won three Stanley Cups, and I believe last night you had your sixth grandchild, is that I right? I did. Six. Le Liam Murphy. Liam Murphy. So you're, you're, you, as of last night, your proportion 
of cups to grandchildren have been has just been skewed. You know that, eh? Yeah. So you gotta, I guess, win another Stanley Cup to it, get it, back. It, it would be nice. Yeah, to get back <laughs> it, into that. <laughs> it would be nice. I know everyone got everyone got a ring, uh -huh. and the the funny thing is, I thought it was important that everyone got the same ring. Some of these some teams uh, tier them. Uh -huh. We don't do it. I said the only caveat is. I don't want to sign the check to see how much we spend on him. <laughs> so John keeps that John one. John keeps that, that. That's his check, and he had someone else sign that, <laughs> countersign it. Yeah, so it gets buried. Nobody knows about that's that. Right. Well, congratulations on another uh, uh, grandchild. Thank I know you. that's important to you. Family is very important to you, uh, and it always has been, not just for you, but your entire family going back to your grandfather. It, it, it seems like uh, a big part of your success as a family uh, has been the family unit. Uh, you've got a lot of people involved and there's a lot of personalities, but I know family is really important to you. Tell me about the family, your family, but then talk about the family of the Hawks, you know, the people, your employees, and how you sort of see them as family. Well, the, the, you see them as family because you want them to feel that it's, it's fun to come to work mm -hmm. and they're a part of something. Mm -hmm. um, that the family looks at things long term. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about every quarter being better than the next quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, so many public companies um, have that feel, but uh, we're, we're blessed to have employees that 10 years is not a long time to work for the company. Mm -hmm. And we have employees that have been there 40 years plus, and we had one that's been there 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so you celebrate success with everyone. Um, and, it, and I think it's just something that uh, that you, you give them a feel that, you know, as you said, we have believe in a flat organization. We don't have pyramids. Um, we roll up our sleeves. We've all done different, uh, you know, parts of the business. Beverage side, I worked on the trucks and when I was in college, so you understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I think that you just don't put any ears on. And, you, and the nice thing about the family is you check your ego at the door. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the reputation that the, the Hawks organization has around the league, amongst other owners and other CEOs, is that the, the organization here is a, is a family business. Family business, but, you know, the, you know, the players, uh, you, I think it's very important to have boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, I kid about it with John McDonough, the time you want to go in the locker room is after the last win, you know, of the Stanley Cup. Then you go in the locker room. Right. But other than that, you know, it's not our place. So one of the first things that um, one of the... Um, Assistants did well, after dad passed away is gave me a key to the locker room. This is before John was there. And I said, what's this for? They said, well, if you want to go down and take a sauna or, you know, I said, well, that's not my office. It's not my place to do that. Um, they said, well, there are people used to do that. I said, well, that's different here. We're not going to ever do that. Uh, I'm not going to go in that locker room. It's not my place. The players always welcome up in our office. Yeah. But I think that the, uh, uh, the sanct, you know, the, what goes on in the locker room stays in the locker room and those, and it's very important. They have a cohesive team and not have the owner in there butting their nose into players' businesses. So the business is evolving constantly. The industry is evolving constantly. It seems to me, uh, so in Canada, there, the, the, the television contract that took place in Canada a few years ago with Rogers, uh, $5.2 billion, and it's, it's, it's causing, there's some, there's some waves up in Canada right now around Hockey Night in Canada and around Rogers and Sportsnet because they've been laying off all the top expensive talent uh, who are on TV, you know, the, the favorite, the favorites of the fans who sure. turn it, tune in and watch. Been watching all the, every it's, Saturday night. Yeah, for years. So there's, there's this like, there's, you know, everyone's talking about the contract was, you know, too big and whatever. The contract is coming in the United States in a couple of years from now. And it, of course, the U.S. market is 10 times the size of the Canadian market. And I know it's, you know, it's on the, it's on the minds of the, the owners and the executive committee. When you look at the future of the revenue streams for your team, but not just your team, because you're on the, you're on the executive committee, so you're looking at all teams. What, what do you see as the future main revenue source uh, going forward? Is it still going to be ticket sales? Is it going to be corporate sponsorship? Or is it going to really be media-related revenues? It's going to be all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, how we get that signal, if it's on your phone now, in five years from now, who knows? It's moving so quickly. Mm -hmm. We'll get the signal. And, it, and uh, it's, I think it's going to be a combination. I think the best days are ahead of us. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be the same you know, way that you watched it or your father watched the, the games or heard the games or something. Uh, social media has changed the whole landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, you know, being, it's funny, my daughter had the baby 
And everyone that was, uh, when she posted on Facebook, everyone knew about it. In the old days, I used to pick up the phone and call people. So now, but that's it. You know, things are moving so quickly. And I think that I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, Gary negotiating that, that TV contract. I kind of think it's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be much broader, in my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. I think that um, you look at how the league revenues have grown. Mm -hmm. just, in, just since Dad passed away, I think they were... Uh, about a billion dollars at that time. I think they're over four billion now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when you look at the price of these franchises, six hundred fifty million for an expansion franchise is not bad. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm I'm really looking excited. In a market like Chicago, uh, I think we have a, a whole untapped uh, fan base, and that's the Hispanic fan base. Because mm -hmm. I look at hockey as soccer and ice. We have about a third of the Chicago population is Hispanic. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done uh, different outreach programs. I talked to uh, John McDonough and the management team on, on coming up with different ways. Uh, half our, our, our home games are all in Spanish mm -hmm. and you can put the SAP and so you can have it on the telecast. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something, uh, we have Fifth Third Arena which is two blocks away from here. And uh, so you can be in the city and expose this great game to people that had never seen it before or even know what a sheet of ice is. Mm -hmm. um, we have an outreach program uh, called uh, First stride, mm -hmm. and the first stride program is we have 40 minutes on the ice and then 40 minutes in the classroom and do different STEM programs. Mm -hmm. And that's for anyone, you know, in the public school system. And uh, we've had uh, over 35,000 students through there. Uh, we pay for all the busing and everything to get them here and to work in, during the day. So I think that this is ways to do it. Plus, you know, hockey is, as I said, a family sport. And I think that you, you'll see families coming in here because uh, it's how do you find entertainment that you can do together mm -hmm. and that people. 40% of our, our fans are women. Uh, you go tonight to the game, you look at how many women are there. Um, many times a woman is the one that controls the, the household income, yeah. uh, the finances. Mm -hmm. So uh, Papa, as much as he would admit you know, that he controls everything, he's the king of the castle, we know that's not true. Right. Uh, so if Mama's happy, he's happy. And uh, so guess what? She's the one that says, no, I think you buy the ticket package. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'll see different... Uh, you asked about season tickets. I think there could be different ways to do that. I mean, I think you have to look at value-added mm -hmm. uh, programs. Tonight we have people going over and skating before the fifth third, and you get a dinner and then come to the game. Yeah. Um, you can get different promotional items. It's not always about the, the puck. It's about the experience. It's about everything. Um, and how do you connect with those fans? Uh, how do you uh, help the fans understand uh, that your players are not one-dimensional? And you can do that through so, uh, social media and then tell them stories about them and then tell them stories about you know, what they do on a game day. And people are fascinated. What does Jonathan Taze do mm -hmm. uh, tonight before a game? Mm -hmm. And just talking to them you know, through social media and how, how, you can, uh, how do you connect with those. Well, you're lucky to have Jonathan Taze. Uh, and and uh, uh, when I was chairman of Bauer, I signed him right away to a, a Bauer contract. Uh, what, a, what a great ambassador for the game. And most people don't realize he's bilingual. Thanks. And, and quite good. Um, you know, he has no accent or anything. And I kid with him, he said he speaks to his mother in French and his dad in English. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's a great, he's a great ambassador. And, and Patrick Kane as well. We signed well, him as well. Well, certainly. Yeah, he's unbelievable. So how do you see the eSports? Because you're talking about families, you're talking about kids. eSports is on every owner's agenda or, you know, at least, you know, um, you know vision. What, what, how do you see eSports tying into your, your team? Well, I think it's 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 part of it's again it's it's all part of it, but it's not it's just one one one, one piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, I I think it's it's what you do, uh, how you communicate, and what form you're doing that, mm -hmm. and what information you're always giving out about your players and, and, and what's going on. So esports is part of it, but um, the what you find is millennials and 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 Gen Zs are starved for information, mm -hmm. and so you just have to give it to them in whatever form they're they're looking at. And of course, around the corner now is, is gaming and gambling. It's it's coming fast, you know, coming fast, and it's going to impact uh, every team at the league. Uh, I think Gary, you know, I've always said that Gary's vi always had you know 2020 vision always. And if you look back 11 years ago when he first brought the uh, the award ceremony out to Vegas and heavily criticized for it, yes, especially in Canada, yeah. uh, heavily criticized. But it was planting a seed and it was opening up that market. And here we are, a, you know, a decade later, and, you know, there's a team in Vegas, which, you know, people never would have believed that 10 years ago. No, I mean, and look at, and look at the success they've had. Mm -hmm. And with, you know, suddenly, you know, generally out there, transplants. Mm -hmm. 
we, were, we went out there and did business in 1977. At that time, there's 230,000 people lived there. There was one high school in Las Vegas and one Catholic church. Wow. So, you know, and you look where it is today, yeah. how it's grown, and, and uh, the gaming used to be what brought people in, now it's entertainment, and gaming is, happens to be part of it. I think gaming is to be part of the entertainment package. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll come to the United Center, yeah, the Hawks are there, but gaming is to be part of that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that that's going to be uh, an important piece. I think it's going to increase the value of these franchises. Mm -hmm. um, Gary was, was very good and didn't take a position. He didn't really think and he didn't agree with uh, gaming, but once the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, you can't, mm -hmm. then he was the first commissioner to get on and mm -hmm. say, no, we're going to embrace this. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have real, uh, be the only one being, we being the NHL, to have the real time uh, information and pa player and truck pa uh, uh, puck uh, tracking. Okay. It's been, he's, been doing, he's been working on that for a long time, but mm -hmm. how do you get something inside that puck mm -hmm. to work on it? So even before that, knowing that the information is everything. Mm -hmm. And if the league controls that information and then people have to go back and buy that from them, mm -hmm. that's extra, obviously, another revenue source. So I, I just think that these are all positive things for the league and for those franchises um, that, are, you know, that we have now. So looking at five years, five, ten years, you know, you've got a franchise, you've got esports connected to it, you've got gaming of some sort connected to it, mm -hmm. you've got all sorts of outreach programs to, uh, uh, you know, different communities that are within the, 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 the your community in within your community. Yes. Uh, you've got a new television or media contract. I, I don't like to use. I like calling it a television contract. Yeah, it won't be. It's it going to be. It might be. Yeah. You know, a combination of cable, a uh, combination of you know, every TV is hooked up to the internet. Mm -hmm. You look at where Netflix and everyone else is like that. It's no longer the same. Mm -hmm. uh, what you do is you have fresh content every night. Mm -hmm. And that's every game is fresh content for us. Yeah, and it's live, and it's one of the few remaining live um, uh, television or events that people want to pay for immediately. And you know, and if you know that, you know who what the score of the game is. Going back and watching it a second time is not too great. No. And you can go back and watch reruns. We can watch old movies, you mm -hmm. know, fifty, hundred times, but you're not going to watch another hockey game. So that's why it's immediate. Mm -hmm. And I think as the it's, it's a fast game, it's immediate, and I think the best days are ahead of us, and I'm excited about it. So when I, when I map, I'm a financial guy, when I map out this new media contract that's coming in a couple of years, uh, it seems to me that as soon as that thing is signed, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a big contract, no matter how it looks, it's gonna be that's a right. big number. To me, that's going to lift uh, every franchise. There, there won't be a franchise in the NHL worth less than a billion. You know, because of the because of that revenue no, I think stream. That's right. I think that's right. Now, you're obviously there'll be some that are worth a lot more than a billion. It'll be two and three billion. But there's going to be the the smaller markets. Just having an NHL franchise is going to be worth a billion dollars. So that's what I think in five or ten years from now. And uh, the cap will be uh, over a hundred million dollars at that point. And it's going to be great. It's going to be great for the players. Mm -hmm. Now, from our family, with all due respect, it really doesn't matter mm -hmm. what they're worth. Right. It's only it only matters what you're worth is when you when you want to monetize it and sell it, right? Or buy a piece of it, or sell a piece of it, or do something. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but I agree with you. I mean, these franchise we just we just begun to see the cusp of what the value of these franchises are, mm -hmm. and and I think this the sport's going to really explode. And you said where you mm -hmm. um, where hockey news, so much of it is outside. I mean, who knows that the champion, you know, the, the winner of the Stanley Cup could play very well. The winner in, in Europe, no question, or, uh, or Russia or whomever. Well, ten, uh, in 2009, I had the good fortune, I guess, to I went to the first ever KHL game in Ufa, Russia, in the middle of Russia, and there was nobody in the stands, and uh, it was me and Tretziak and a couple of other guys, uh, and it was like um, it was it was uh, difficult to watch. Let's just put it that way. But in 10 years, they've really improved the game. They're now shrinking. They used to play on Olympic sheets. Then they went to the KHL size. Now they're going to the NHL size. They're actually converting rinks in the KHL to NHL size because they have now sort of admitted, not really out verbally too much, but they've sort of said it's a better game. Well, it's a much better game. And uh, we played an exhibition game in Berlin and then a regular season game in Prague. And, and the, the Prague ice was, you know, NHL size. Mm. Um, and the Berlin ice was larger. And it's a completely different game. Mm. And so it, I think it was fun for the players to play that, but not so much because, you know, you was, again, it's more like soccer because you, you, you don't have 
uh, soccer, you're, you, you're outside and you're not at the sidelines all the time. Here, you, you aren't on the boards mm-hmm. on, on that larger rink. So is the next move for improving the, your business around here, is it development around it? Because it seems like a lot of owners are building their arenas, but they're really looking at the real estate around the building. And you've had a real estate, your, your family's been in real estate forever. Is development adjacent to this building uh, with you and Jerry uh, a, a priority? Well, we're, we're blessed because we're 19 uh, blocks west of uh, downtown. Mm-hmm. So we're in an urban building. So you can be down and dress in a suit, mm-hmm. uh, come down and entertain during the day, um, you know, at night. And uh, this area, 25 years ago, the building, the United Center is now 25 years, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. Mm-hmm. You came back here 25 years ago, and to say the area around here was blighted was maybe an understatement. Mm-hmm. And how you've seen the improvement, mm-hmm. um, again, and how things uh, disrupt different organizations and different models. Mm-hmm. Used to have to have needed 6,000 cars for a building this size. Mm-hmm. With Uber and Lyft, you don't need that anymore. Right. And we have now an Uber lot. Mm-hmm. Um, it's much like in the airports where they, you know, it tells you which lane to go to. We'll have a warming house or in the, in the summer that where you can you know, cool down mm-hmm. um, in a nice area, plug your phone in. Um, and uh, so then, consequently, the surface uh, parking lots aren't uh, as necessary as they used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, public transportation is there. We're going to have a L stop down there. So I think you could very well see this as an entertainment uh, area. Mm-hmm. We call this a, a, a campus. Uh, with obviously United Center, they have the Advocate Center where the Bulls practice across the street, mm-hmm. and two blocks down where the Hawks uh, practice. But it's really a community ice rink. It's a it's a place where the Hawks are on the ice for 40 minutes maybe twice a week, maybe, and the community uses it the rest of the time. And that's just two blocks from here. Yeah, so that seems to be, because when I came in today, and I've been here many times, but when I came in today, I was more looking at the parking lots uh, that are adjacent to this building, and I could sort of see, you know, towers going up around this building, and I thought, after reading your book, or the book on, on you and your family, and your real estate background, it just seems to me it's a natural, it's going to happen one day. Is that on the agenda for down the road to consider well, I, that? I, I think you're always looking at how do you, how do you use this building 365 days a year? Mm-hmm. And we have over 200 events now mm-hmm. uh, between the basketball and hockey, but all the uh, music events and the different, and then using the parking lots in the summer mm-hmm. for different festivals and different things you can do. I mean, we had three and three hockey. Mm-hmm. Um, when we had the uh, NHL draft, we, we had a kind of a fan zone out there. It was, it was fun and, and interactive things going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I think the, um, that we, we're, we're, you're going to see a lot more out of here. By the way, about your book, I'm going back to the book again one more time. The only, the only problem I had with the book was that it took to page 155 to mention the hockey news. That that's got you got to get to the writer. We should, and say, we should have done it right. Yeah. I think we should we should have had Tony Esposito put it in his. It should have been in the forward. Right that's in the right. forward. Right, right in the first page. <laughs> it should first, have been right up first there. First page. Yeah. yeah. So I was waiting for the hockey news, and there was. But at least angry. you got to mention. I got to mention. So we got to mention. But uh, uh, last thing I want to talk to you about is is the 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 structure of the owners and the executive committee, and how you know the how important the executive committee really is. It's it to me, it's a group of. I think 10 owners or 10. 10. And then the finances, or the, you know, audit is five. Right. And that, those 10 are, I mean, all owners are, por- are important and all owners have a, a, a role to play in the league. But those 10 really sort of set the tone. They sort of are closer to Gary on bouncing off ideas and for future vision kind of things. In that space, in that 10 uh, owners uh, group that you, that you sit in, what, what is it, when you're walking into an executive committee meeting, where's, what are you thinking about? What's on your mind and what, what do you want to accomplish in that executive committee meeting? Well, you want to first of all be on the same page. Mm-hmm. And uh, Gary does a good job of communicating with us so you know what his thinking is. And then, and then quite frankly, having um, you know, a healthy league mm-hmm. um, and, and being on you know, strong financial uh, footings and then making sure that... Um, you know, this, this, this league is run profitably in the right way. Um, and then have the respect that we're always learning from other, other owners what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about the gaming before, what, what Ted Leonsis is doing down mm-hmm. in gaming. I ta- mentioned that to Jerry Reinsdorf. Mm-hmm. I think Jerry has visited him, you know, in Washington, looked what he has to do, and we're going to learn a lot from him. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of different things. We talk about, um, you know, I mean, you, you look at, you know, Ted, uh, you know, started AOL. I mean, mm-hmm. how, how early he was. <laughs> yeah way before people thought of the internet and websites or anything else. Mm-hmm. So 
I think it's going in there, one being on the same page, then bouncing ideas off Gary and vice versa, and then quite frankly, um, learning from each other. Do you find that you, you're, when you leave the room, so when you go in, you're, you want to make sure you're on the same page, but when you leave the room, do you find the, 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 that you have a lot of work to do after the executive committee meeting, that you have been, you know, you've, there's been new stuff that's been put on your lap and that you sort of have to say, okay, well, I've got to have to focus on this and go back to John and... No, I think you, you go, you've done that before. Mm -hmm. So you, you talk about bouncing things off there and then you, had, you get your agenda and then I, I don't... I think when you leave there, you, then, then you realize, then you're going to have your regular uh, Board of Governors meeting thereafter. Mm -hmm. And most all the subjects are the same things that you had, you know, that you already discussed. So there's, there's very, very little new that comes out uh, from the Board of Governors that hasn't already been, you know, fully fleshed out in the Executive Committee. Right. Now, I, I've been a chairman of the Board of a public traded company. Um, I sort of understand what the role is. I sort of look, uh, it's a different structure, obviously, but, you know, Gary's the CEO of the league, you know, the way yes, I look yeah, at it. Right. And you're the board of directors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're in any corporate environment, especially publicly traded companies, the board of directors' most important job is hiring and firing a CEO. I mean, that's, that's number one. That's their right, job. Right, right. Uh, and holding them accountable. And holding them accountable, exactly, exactly. Which may lead to a firing or, it could be. or exactly. So that's your main job, and obviously Gary's got a terrific track record. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I just don't know any other CEO put in that position could have done as well as uh, lead this uh, league as, as he has from the outside looking. Well, in. and then uh, you getting a hard cap, and it, it took a lot of pain. I mean, mm -hmm. a year where you weren't doing business and and a lockout, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, those are painful times. Mm -hmm. But it puts us in a very strong footing for the future. Mm. And I think the players will realize that we all want to make money. And if, if we can make money together, mm. we have to have a strong league to do that. And the only way to do that is to, is to work together and not have we and they and, and look at the management as evil and the players, you know, as, as something. Um, so I think a lot of it is just, you know, communicating and letting people know, you know, why you do these things. Most of the reasons, you know, there's always good reasons for decisions that people just don't always know why you make those decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think Gary, you know, has consistently done a good job in that. I mean, I don't think there's a commissioner in any sport that's had the tenure that he's had. No. Well, he's obviously, I think he's the longest serving uh, current, anyways, commissioner. I think he is. By a long shot. Um, but at some point, everybody retires. Everybody, everybody retires. Um, or... Uh, or worse, but everybody retires. Sure. And your job is to sort of uh, have vision. I mean, as a, on a board of directors, you're right. to have vision. Succession is really important in, right. in any organization. Um, you, I'm sure, have all these different companies, and you're always thinking that you've got this CEO here and that CEO there, and that this person's got five years before retirement, that one's got three years, and you've got to start thinking about who's going to replace those people. Is that something that is in the back of your mind with uh, the NHL as well? Because some days Gary's going to retire. Maybe it's 10 years from now. Who knows when it's going to be? But we're, we're just haven't, we just haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you always think about um, not always necessarily even the, the next person. It's, you know, you're looking at succession two down. So I think uh, Gary has you know, structured um, the management team, and he kind of restructured that too, just not having a, one president. Um, and I think that's been good too. Um, but uh, we're not there yet on you know who would be the you know successor for Gary. No, no, it's way too early to, yeah. to talk about. We that, always but, think about it. But you got to have it on your. Sure. It's got to be on your plate. And everyone thinks that. Is there anything else that um, that you know that you think about that others don't think about? Um, you know, they're about the business of hockey and where it's going. I mean, everyone's talking about China. Everyone's talking about the Olympics. Um, they're building rinks over there at a, a at a massive clip. Um, the government, uh, you know, when it's a communist government, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to, you know, build 300 ice rinks. Well, you also see um, with the NBA, you know, what uh, they put on their uh, income statement, because they've been doing it a long time over there, about how fragile it is by, you know, the exhibition games and what was said or not said and, mm. and how they could just stop tomorrow. So, um, I th yeah, I think, yes, it's, it's important, but... Uh, uh, the NBA has done a good job at that, uh, but I think there's you know other things that you can you know really you know work on too. Uh, you know it's funny because last year I think the, the the Chinese that went to some of the went to the Boston game left at the end of the second period because they thought it was like basketball. 
<laughs> I didn't hear that. Yeah, they, oh, really? they weren't there for the third period. Because they thought it was over. Yeah, they thought it was over. No, I, do. <laughs> I did not hear that. So it's going to take it's going to take a little while. It's going to take a little but while. They, but again, you got to tap that and work on it. Mm -hmm. And I give the NBA all the credit. You know, they've worked on it for so long. Well, they've been doing it for a long time. They've yeah. been investing. And hockey, of course, with all the games that the NHL is playing in Europe now, and uh, the, the ex expansion of the NHL outside of North America, which is really going on right now. To, and the IIHF is not so happy about it sometimes, and, and the KHL is not happy about it sometimes. But it's a natural thing to take the product, whatever your product is, to, to expand your, your market right. as much as possible. Is that something that you think about a lot? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, as I said, I went over to Berlin and Prague, and I think that, you know, the big problem you used to have these arenas weren't big enough either. Mm. And, and the one that didn't have them, and two, they weren't big enough. Mm. Um, so as you start seeing... Um, Companies coming in and 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 uh, building these you know new modern facilities and I think it's something that it's I think it's important to expand the game mm -hmm. and not just look at it as North America if you can't look at it that way you got to look at it globally right. whatever that is if you see China Europe uh, we're obviously big in smaller countries that are cold yeah. you know, <laughs> Sweden Finland right. you know uh, we even Hawks even drafted a Danish player you know so I mean you know it's getting you know, Germany and so it's um it's uh, it's exciting, and I think it's sad that we're seeing the infancy of it. Yeah, well, there's a lot of good news about what, where the industry is going, where hockey is going, and where the NHL is going. Is there any area that sort of keeps you up at night? Is there, a, is there an area that says, you know, we really need to, you know, whether it's, uh, I know on everybody's agenda is to increase diversity within every organization, and, and of course, there's a lot of push. and everything. Else. Absolutely, that's, and everybody's, the push is on for the, all that, and it's And good. not only the players in, in, in your front office. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know what? What are we doing as 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 Blackhawks for our front office mm -hmm. for um, diversity and inclusion? Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's something that is, is important. Uh, you just can't have a bunch of you know middle-aged white men. Yeah, can't be guys like us all. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm no longer middle-aged. Oh, I think you are. <laughs> uh, you know, the business roundtable came out in uh, New York, uh, and I think it was Jamie Dimon who was talking about um, that the corporation of the future is not just about the shareholders it's about stakeholders yes, it's right. it's a you know you can't just think about shareholders which is the old way now you got to think about stakeholders the community working the employees you know your customers well the customers and then employees and your future employees depending on what you do and what your outreach is they're not going to come work for you if they don't if they don't see that you know what you know when they you know, you used to come in for an interview, you're going to be interviewed. Now what they do is they come in and interview you. Mm -hmm. You know, they know more about you than you know about them. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're coming in and saying, well, what charities you do? You know, what volunteer work can I do? How many free days could I get to put back in the community to do X, Y, Z? Because quite frankly, if I don't hear that, I'm not coming and working for you. And you see that across all your businesses, right? I mean, yeah, that's, that's everywhere now. Yeah, and, it, and I think it's important. And I think that's what, you know, so your future leaders have to be certainly looking at that. How much time, uh, and this will be my last question for you, how much time do you spend on grooming leaders within your organizations across? Is that, is that high on your agenda? Do you spend a lot of time doing that? Well, I have my son and daughter, and yeah, it is. Uh, my son's 42, my daughter's 40. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, you know, Danny's you know, the beverage business, but he also, uh, you know, is working on stuff at the United Center and, and with the Hawks and, and, and different things. And so, yes, it's, it's very important to, to groom those future leaders. My job is to have the next generation of CEO of, of Words Corporation to be a far better a CEO than I am. And if I've done that, when I'm dead and gone, and can go down and hopefully look down on it, they realize that, that uh, he or she has done a much better job than I have done, than I've done my job. Rocky, thanks for your time. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Thank for you. your time. Thanks, man. Thank you.